In this hour, I am thrilled that we have a guest joining us who is an expert on uh, nuclear energy. Um, it's Arnie Gunderson. Arnie's an energy advisor. He's got 39 years of nuclear power engineering experience. He's a former nuclear industry senior vice president. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in nuclear engineering. He holds a nuclear safety patent. He was a licensed reactor operator. During his nuclear industry career, Arnie managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the country. He speaks now on television and radio and at public meetings on the need for a new paradigm in energy production. Production. An independent nuclear engineering and safety expert, Arnie provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety, and radiation issues to the NRC, congressional and state legislatures, and government agencies and officials throughout the United States, Canada, and internationally. In 2008, he was appointed by the Vermont Senate president to be the first chair of the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant Oversight Panel. He has testified in numerous cases and before many different legislative bodies, including the Czech Republic Senate. Now, I bring all of that up because Arnie is here to talk with us and to share some information with us that's pretty disconcerting. But he has a background that means he understands these things, and I have a feeling he understands these things way better than we do, and some of his information is really going to take us by surprise. His website, by the way, is Fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot com. Arnie, thanks so much for being with us this evening. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, let's talk about Fukushima. I understand you traveled to the site of the disaster. Well, you didn't get uh, all the way into where the power plants were, did you? Uh, no, I, I was in Tokyo, and then I was at a, another nuclear plant that is also shut down, but I didn't get to in, into Fukushima. Yeah, but uh, tell us what you did see there. You did some testing uh, while you were there, didn't you? Yeah, um, there's a there's a large body of, of good data coming out of a, a group of citizen scientists called SafeCast. Uh, they've taken two million data points throughout Japan, um, and um, uh, it, it, they're just an incredible volunteer organization. But when I was over there, I um, I, I brought a Geiger counter, and uh, I, I just took random soil samples. I didn't look for the highest spot or anything like that. Um, I, I was there five days. I took five samples. And um, um, when I came back to the States, I, I declared them through customs, and um, came back to the States, ran them through a lab, and found that all of them would qualify as, as nuclear waste if it happened here in the United States. And, and I think the point I was trying to make by, by uh, taking a look at that, you know, Tokyo is Japan's capital. Mm-hmm. And um, what would it be like if our capital had that, that quantity of, of radioactive waste? How would we feel? And yet within, um, oh, geez, within less than 100 miles of Washington, D.C., there's about a dozen nuclear reactors. So it's not implausible that it could happen here. Well, was the contamination that you discovered, was that from the normal operation of these plants, or was that because of the of the, the horrible accident that happened? No, we're sure it was from Fukushima. And the, the way you can be sure of that is um, there's two isotopes, cesium-134 and cesium-137. And... Um, um, those are emitted in a certain ratio, uh, almost one to one, and um, we saw both of those in exactly the right ratio. So um, it's certain it didn't come from bomb testing, or it hadn't been on the ground from uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki, you know, 60 years ago. Yeah. But it came from the accident at Fukushima. So, but, but what does that mean? I mean, does it does it mean that somebody's going to die? Does it mean that somebody's going to get cancer from that? Or, or does I mean, does it mean anything to find that level of contamination anywhere? Well, what, you know, it's a um, it's a public health hazard as opposed to a personal health hazard. And, and by that, I mean, um, there's about 35 million people in metropolitan Tokyo. And when they're all exposed to levels like that, um, um, the, the incidence of cancer is going to be higher um, as a result. So what, and they're at a point now where they can't run and, and they can't hide, but they can take precautions. Um, one of the samples I had was from a... Uh, a, a kid's um, a school play yard, and it had been decontaminated, and uh, it was still um, uh, radioactive to the yeah. tune of uh, five or six thousand disintegrations per second in a, in a kilogram of soil. About two pounds of soil 
every second would be disintegrating at, at 6,000 disintegrations. So, you know, kids are playing in that. And so, you know, we're, we're advocating taking lots of precautions. You know, the, the Japanese, thankfully, take their shoes off at the door. Uh, so you're not going to track it in. But especially for the kids, because mm-hmm. they're so much more radio sensitive. That means they're more sensitive to radiation than... than um, well, yeah, and, and they'll put the dirt in their mouths. You got it. That's what kids do. I was taking the sample, and there were two little boys running around throwing stones at each other. Yeah. Now, you know, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, well, I have triplets who are eight years old. I, I know how kids are. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ed, I read an article, and, and the reason that I actually asked you to join us was because I read this piece, and uh, it actually gave me goosebumps. It was a piece that was about Reactor 4, the Daiichi plant, uh, Reactor 4, written by Akio Matsumura. And I, I want to share with you how the article begins and share with our audience as well. It says, Japan's former ambassador to Switzerland, Mr. Mitsuhi Murata was invited to speak at the public hearing of the Budgetary Committee of the House of Counselors on March 22nd, 2012, on the Fukushima nuclear power plant's accident. Before the committee, Ambassador Murata strongly stated that if the crippled building of Reactor Unit 4 with 1,535 fuel rods in the spent fuel pool 100 feet above the ground collapses... Not only will it cause a shutdown of all six reactors, but will also affect the common spent fuel pool containing 6,375 fuel rods located some 50 meters from reactor four. In both cases, the radioactive rods are not protected by a containment vessel. Dangerously, they are open to the air. This would certainly cause a global catastrophe like we have never before experienced. He stressed that the responsibility of Japan to the rest of the world is immeasurable. Such a catastrophe would affect us all for centuries. Ambassador Murata informed us that the total numbers of the spent fuel rods at the Fukushima Daiichi site, excluding the rods in the pressure vessel, is 11,421. This sounds pretty frightening to me, Arnie. Um, and I hate to say it, but it's not over the top. I've been working with Ambassador Akio Matsumura for a year now, and, and he is as level-headed as any human being on the, on the planet. Um, I was quoted a, a year ago as saying that if the Unit 4 fuel pool were to um, collapse or, or break and run out of water, um, we would have Chernobyl on steroids. And, and that's still true today. And, and, and here's what's going on there. Um, the, the fuel pools on this type of reactor, this Mark I design, don't have a containment building around it. They basically have a, you know, like a, the storage shed you go down to Sears and buy. They have a, a, <laughs> oh, Lord. They have a storage shed on the top. Uh-oh. And, and the storage shed is, is, has, was blown to smithereens. So the, the water in the fuel pool is now exposed directly to the atmosphere. And um, if the if there's a large seismic event, a seven or a seven and a half, the, less than the previous one because the buildings are damaged, but mm-hmm. but it would um, it would either crack the pool or make the building collapse. Now there's one study done by Brookhaven National Labs, and it was uh, it's about ten years old, and it said in the event that the the fuel is not cooled in a fuel pool. You can expect um, about 180,000 cancer fatalities. Okay, Arnie, I want you to hold on. I've got to take a break, but this is important. I I want us to spend some time on this. So hold on with me. We'll come back and continue our discussion. Uh, 808-0810 is our telephone number, by the way. I'm Pat Thurston. Arnie Gunderson is my guest. We're talking about Fukushima, and you're listening to KGO. Arnie Gunderson is my guest. We're talking about Fukushima. What is going on there now? It's been over a year since the uh, earthquake, the horrible earthquake and then the tsunami that caused the damage that it caused uh, in Japan. And, of course, we know about the uh, Daiichi plants there, and uh, we were all watching it. And we saw that explosion that happened when they did the hydrogen release, and, you know, we were all talking and all nervous. And what we thought, I think, Arnie, was that if there was going to be a really, really big disaster, that we were imagine all of none of us know this stuff. You know this stuff. We don't know this stuff. We think about the China syndrome, and what we imagine is that suddenly this 
whole power plant starts sinking and it goes way, way, way down. And then this big mushroom cloud comes up and it's like an atomic bomb that's exploded right there. So that's what we thought. And we figured if that didn't happen, uh, everything was probably going to be okay. They got everything under control. Tell us what the reality is, though. This is like um, a, a Chucky horror movie. You know, you, every time you <laughs> every time you think Chucky. you got it killed, it comes back. Yeah. Uh, and um, <laughs> and the biggest problem still is uh, is that fuel pool on Unit Four. Yeah. You know, they each of them. First off, there's this comment called safe shutdown, and you'll hear it if Diablo Canyon shuts down or San Onofre. They'll say the unit safely shut down. Now, what that means is the control rods fall in. But that only puts 95% of the heat away. Okay, now wait. When the control rods fall in, what they do is they get between the things that are reacting with one another and stop the reaction, the chain reaction it. from going? Okay. You got it. All right. But because the chain reaction already occurred, there's pieces of uranium called fission products that are left, and they give off about 5% of the heat from the nuclear reactor, and that doesn't stop. So, of course, what happened at Fukushima was because they couldn't cool that 5%, um, they had the explosions and the, and the melt-throughs and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, um, that, and, and we still don't know everything that's going on inside there, do we? I mean, didn't I hear recently that it's so hot that the robots can't even function in there? Yes. Uh, the, the radiation exposure in the best reactor, which is Unit 2, was uh, 7,000 R an hour. A thousand R will kill you in about fifteen minutes. So mm. you know this is incredibly mm. high radiation, so high that it would affect robot circuitry in an hour or two. So um, how they're uh, going to solve those problems is um, you know we're relying on technology that hasn't been built yet to solve um, those problems. And then these the, the the pools that have the spent fuel rods, and we're talking now reactor four. This this scary situation where you've got this structure that's all damaged. And this is sort of in the open air. I mean, it's covered with water, but it's up in the air and there's nothing covering it right now, right? Right. Okay. And what makes Reactor 4 so bad is that not only does it have old fuel, like Unit 1 has fuel that's like 12 years old, and it's plenty cool, but Reactor 4 has one-year-old fuel that had just been removed from the nuclear reactor Uh and is now sitting in that pool. So if the pool were to leak or if the pool were to lose its cooling, uh, it would either boil dry or run dry quite quickly. What happens then is the the fuel rods get hot enough that the metal, called zircaloy, burns in air. It just sucks up the oxygen from air Mm -hmm. and and burns, in which case you don't have a meltdown. You've got a a pyre of uh, radioactive smoke going up. And uh, you know, the, and so the comment that um, Ambassador Matsumura was talking about was that um, I think was that if the wind is blowing, uh, some of the time the wind blows out to sea. And thank God, if there was a savings grace at Fukushima, it's that eighty percent of the nuclear um, um, radiation went out to sea, and only twenty percent went inland. It could have easily have been just the other way, in which case. Japan would have been cut in half for 300 years. Oh, my God. So the concern is that that can happen if the fuel pool catches fire. And then if the whatever has gone out to sea, whether it's come from the water that's leaked, because we know about that, or the water that was used to try to cool things down in the, in the beginning after, you know, the generators were, were shut down and everything, uh, when the water goes out to sea, is that okay? I mean, it's radioactive, but the sea's really big. So does it make that not a dangerous situation um it makes it less dangerous you know it, there's still the same amount of radiation but like you said the pacific ocean is a big place and um, i suspect we'll see it working its way up the food chain through fish and and ultimately winding up on on people's dinner plates but but compared to it lying on the soil yeah. um, like is happening in some areas of fukushima but could happen throughout Japan. Compared to that, it's it's much less severe. Okay, let me ask you, and obviously I know nothing about this stuff, so it's it's all an education to me. Let me ask you about the pools themselves. They're not covered up. They've got these rods in there that are that would that are trying to cool down. Are they while they're cooling, I assume they're still emitting radioactivity. Does the water prevent i mean is it not still going out into the air yes um there's some radiation being given off 
because the water is steaming and, and boiling. Um, but, the, but, but you hit the nail on the head. For about three or four, maybe five years, that water has to be cooled. After that, um, there's probably not much of this heat left, and, and we're in a different game. But why everybody's pay, paying all this attention to Unit 4 is that we have four years to go, and that pool has to be cooled. And if there's a seismic event um, that either stops the cooling or cracks the pool or knocks the building over, um, any one of those would, would cause a, a chain reaction of things. That's the wrong, the wrong word. would cause a series of things uh, to occur. First is the, the possibility of a fire. And, and uh, um, this, once this fire starts, it can't be put out by water, which is it's called pyrophoric. When you spray mm-hmm. water on it, it takes the oxygen from the water and then gives off hydrogen, which then explodes and right. makes it worse. So this yeah. is not something you want to put, pour water on. But the other part that um, Investor Matsumura was talking about was it's, it's highly radioactive so that the entire site would become very difficult, if not uninhabitable. So the concern about the other fuel pool was that if this, if this pool were to go dry, and, and let's assume it didn't fall but it went dry yeah. 100 feet in the air, it would be like a beacon, but instead of a beacon of light, it would be a beacon of radiation and bathe the site in high levels of radiation. That's not something you want because it would make work on other units uh, uh, darn near impossible. And, and if people breathed in the uh, whatever would have you know been created by the smoke from the fire, would that be potentially deadly to them? Yes. You know, yeah. if you look at the people on the site now, they're all wearing um, you know pretty good respirators, um, and uh, you, you, they would. But even that wouldn't be enough because there's something called sky shine. The the gamma rays. Forget the particles that get caught in your lungs, but the gamma rays would go up and bounce to go off air molecules and come down as a shine of radiation over the site. And it would go right through those suits, and the guys wow. would be exposed from, uh, from the, the sky shine. So that's, that's the other Holy concern. mackerel, I never heard of anything like that. That's, I mean, this is really scary. Now, all right, let me ask you this. We, th- th- because when this thing happened, I mean, there were, there were so many people who were talking about what could happen, what wouldn't happen, what the good news is, what the bad news might be. But one thing that we always heard, and I want you to tell me if this is true or not, we heard that even in Chernobyl and even at Three Mile Island, no one died as a result of those accidents. Is that true? Well, um, no, it's not true. It's not true at all. Um, there's a lot of good peer-reviewed data coming out at Three Mile Island that now shows that about uh, a 10 to 15 percent increase in lung cancers in people that were um, in the in the vicinity of the plant um, in the first 10 days of the accident. And the, the guys, uh, Dr. Steve Wing is the guy who's done the studies, and like I said, it's peer-reviewed. There's also a study out of Pittsburgh now showing a statistically meaningful increase in leukemias. But, you know, you have to wait a while for, for these cancers to develop. So the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's website, says nobody, nobody was killed, but, but they're just wrong. Um, uh, as far they're, as, they're protecting the industry, aren't they? Yes, I've said that for a long time. And, and uh, you know, um, Congress is, is controlled by the industry, and Congress appoints the people that run the commission, so mm. they're controlled. What a now, cozy relationship. Yes. Now, on Chernobyl... Um, there's a there's some books out on Chernobyl that show something on the order of a, mil, a million fatal a million cancers from from the Chernobyl accident. Um, now the the nuclear industry will say 28, which was the number of uh, firemen that died in the first month. Um, there were people called the liquidators, and they would grab nuclear fuel that was lying around in the yard, throw it into the nuclear reactor, and they would be exposed for about five minutes. They were they were in the military or six. 600,000 of them. They would work for five minutes, they were given their discharge papers, and they were sent home forever. Wow. Um, and of the liquidators, about um, 100,000 of those have already died of cancer. So Holy that, mackerel. That, so there's, there's a great book out by a guy named Yablokov on Chernobyl, and, and there are other books as well. Hey, Arnie, uh, I know that um, you're supposed to only be with us till 5.30. Can you stay a little bit longer? 
Sure. Okay, good. I've got to take a, a break here and get some news in, and then we'll continue our discussion. We'll cool. Good evening, I'm Pat Thurston. Uh, my guest is Arnie Gunderson, and uh, we're talking about uh, Fukushima right now. And, you know, there are people who are probably just tuning in. I gave a pretty lengthy introduction to uh, to Arnie and, and his credentials. Arnie, how would you sum it up? If you were going to tell people what your expertise is and why you know what you're talking about, what would you say? Um, 40 years, uh, senior vice president. The former senior vice president in the nuclear industry worked at about 70 different nuclear plants. And as far as Fukushima goes, one of the divisions I ran built nuclear fuel racks for boiling water reactors identical to Fukushima. So when we talk about the nuclear fuel pool in Fukushima, I can close my eyes and see what it looks like. Wow, no kidding. Uh, I've got so many questions for you, but I do have some listeners who've been waiting patiently. I'm going to let them get in on our discussion, okay? Okay. We'll start with Karen. Karen's calling from San Francisco. Hi, Karen. Welcome to KGO. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I had a question about um, the, the super rich and Silicon Valley backing um, hundreds of more nuclear power plants in America. I think um, the owner of Facebook and um, Peter Thiel, spelled T-H-E-I-L, Thiel, yeah. um, and that they, they, they want more nuclear power. And the whole insurance issue, why is the government giving insurance to new, these new nuclear power plants that, when um, it's so obvious? that they're not safe. Um, you know, and, and I wanted to get into this discussion with you a little bit, um, Arnie, because the the kind of reactor that we're talking about at Fukushima, that you said that's the Mark I design, is that substantially different from the nuclear power plants that exist today or the ones that would be built if there were new plants to be constructed? Well, on the West Coast, there's only one like it, and that's up at uh, Columbia up in Washington State. Um, the reactors you've got in um, in California are pressurized water reactors, and it's a boiling water reactor. But you know the issues of of um, when the control rods fall in, only ninety five percent of the heat is removed. That's a law of physics. Um, it's interesting because we've been told that that what what knocked out Fukushima was the tsunami, yeah. and the tsunami killed the diesels. That's not what happened. What happened was the tsunami knocked out the water pumps that are right along the ocean. And those, the water pumps cool the diesels. So even if the diesels hadn't been cooled out, even if they were on top of a Golden State Bridge or something like that, mm-hmm. um, they would not have been able to be cooled because the ocean had destroyed the pumps. Then you've got that up at Diablo Canyon, and you've got that down at San Onofre, where the water pumps have to be at the ocean because that's where the water is. So... The underlying accident, whether or not it's like Fukushima, is something called the loss of the ultimate heat sink. And ultimate is the key word there. Um, so that um, the NRC is finally getting around to looking at that, but it'll probably be five or six or seven years before they come up with a plan on how to secure that, those pumps that are down by the water and keep those reactors cool. Well, what uh, uh, plants that are being constructed today, ah, are yes. they safe? Um, well, there's only four, and they're all in uh, in the south. Uh, the plants that are being constructed are a different design, and um, they will run without power for uh, three or four days, uh, which is a good thing. But in the process, they've added. It's like you know, when you solve one problem, you create another. Um, they could not have withstood the earthquake at Fukushima. And they're not even licensed to go in California because your mm-hmm. earthquakes are much more severe than we have in the south southeast. So, um, you know, so to solve the problem of running out of electricity, they created a plant that is nowhere near as seismically tough. But the other point, and and I think your the, the the listener was onto it, is the is the cost. Mm-hmm. Um, these things, um, San Onofre costs about four billion for the two units. New two unit sites are now pushing twenty eight billion dollars. Oh God! So and Wall Street won't touch them. So the only way they're getting built is by loan guarantees. It's sort of like you know you signing a a, 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 a note. liar loan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For, no, your neighbor's kid wants to buy oh. a car, and mom and dad won't won't. It won't chip in, so you sign a note for your neighbor's kid. Well, we've all done that. The United States has signed uh, $16 billion worth of notes for these reactors down in the south that nobody will touch because they're too expensive. So if, if left to its druthers, um, if, if we really were capitalists, um, 
nuclear we wouldn't have nuclear power because they're so expensive to build uh, and, and as your your listener also said, you know, we also subsidize the insurance. They don't have to pay insurance because if they break, uh, they would come out of the U.S. Treasury to to fix. You know, Fukushima is going to cost a half a trillion dollars. Yeah, and you know, I but there was I know I've got more calls I want to get to, but uh, part of this story that was published by Akio Matsumura, um, he sent a letter to Robert Alvarez, former senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment of the U.S. Department of Energy, because he wanted an explanation of what the potential impact would be out of the reactor four rods and the other rods that are there at the Daiichi site. And at the end, his conclusion is more than 200 times the amount of cesium-137 released at the Chernobyl accidents is estimated would be released. So what Akio says here is that many of our readers might find it difficult to appreciate the actual meaning of the figure, yet we can grasp what 200 times more cesium-137 than the Chernobyl would mean. It would destroy the world environment and our civilization. Is that true? Um Everything, I guess I would absolutely agree with everything except the last sentence. And okay. I could actually give another example. Okay. There's more cesium in that fuel pool than in all of the 800 nuclear bombs that were exploded above ground in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, but, of course, it would happen all at once. Um, it would certainly destroy Japan as a functioning country. Oh, my God. And, and, you know, it would spread around the world and and, um, and make life difficult to f- further, the, you know, move, move south of the equator uh, if that ever happened. I think that's probably the lesson there. And that's why um, the critical issue, and I don't know why Tokyo Electric hasn't moved faster, they, they've got to get the fuel out of Unifor. And now they're finally coming up with a plan where they're going to build a building over top of the building. But and that's, that's what they did in Chernobyl, isn't it? A sarcophagus? Yes, but this one is going to be a crane building so they can lift all the fuel out. Oh. The, the problem is the crane, the fuel is so radioactive, it has to be stored in a container that weighs 100 tons. So they, you need a pretty darn powerful crane to hold 100 tons. Yeah. So they're building a building outside of the building that's blown to smithereens that'll kind of go over the top. Right. And that will be the crane building to lift this 100-ton canister. Wow. Okay. And so we just have to pray there's no earthquake before that happens. Right. And, uh, you know, we have been, Akio and I and Bob Alvarez, I've known Bob since the 90s. He's he's a really smart man. Um, Anyway, we have been pushing the Japanese to move faster um, and I don't know why they're not. You know, the, this is a problem that now they're talking about it being another four years or five years before this building is built. And uh, like you said, earthquakes don't wait. Yeah, they're also talking about uh, building more nuclear plants. Uh, Arnie, look, I've got to take one more break here, but I- I'm going to hang on to you, okay? Okay. All right, because I-, I do want to get some of our listener questions answered. Eight zero eight zero eight ten. I'm Pat Thurston, Arnie Gunderson, my guest. This is KGO. Good evening, I'm Pat Thurston. Arnie Gunderson is my guest, and we're talking about issues concerning nuclear power plants, but it, specifically we have been talking about Fukushima. Uh, and, uh, Arnie, I do want to get some of our listeners involved with us again. Let's go to Roger in Alameda. Roger, hi. Welcome to KGO. You're on with Arnie Gunderson. Go ahead. Hi, Pat. I do have a question for Arnie, and uh, I wanted to say, first of all, that it seems like we're in the grips of some sort of economic and political insanity that continues to promote the nuclear industry as it is now structured. And sure, some people will make a lot of money, but is it worth damaging the Earth's environment to the extent that we can? And my question for him is as follows. My belief is that nuclear power generation at this point should be restricted to laboratories where people do research on it. Uh, I wonder what his opinion is. Should we be shutting all nuclear power plants down at this point? Should we be keeping just the existing and not building new ones? Or um, should we be looking to build new plants when the technology is safe? Uh, those are excellent questions, Arnie. Um, yeah, they, they really are. Um, you know, I guess on my journey through through life here, I started out as you know a nuclear engineer and, and thought that the math is very compelling and I could get excited about it and thought I was going to save the world. Um, Then I became a whistleblower in 1990 and realized that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wasn't doing its job, but I still believed in the technology. And then Fukushima came, and 
and it convinced me that we are not smart enough for this technology as, as a as a race. People are just not smart enough. Mother Nature will figure out something that can destroy one of these. So, you know, I, but but yet we can't shut them all down tomorrow. I have gone on record with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. There's 23 plants in the U.S. that are just like Fukushima, and uh, those should be shut down. But uh, as far as the other 80, I don't think we should relicense them, but I, I, I don't think as a nation we can just unilaterally shut them down tomorrow. You know, it's a technology that can destroy a country. Um, Nikolai Gorbachev, in his um, memoir, said that it wasn't perestroika that destroyed the Soviet Union. It was Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we're watching it pan out over in, in Japan as well. And, it, you know, it's, you can have 40 years of good days and one bad day and you're toast. And, and I, I don't think we really comprehend that this is a technology that can destroy a country. Yeah, and taking risks like that. Now, I have heard people speak of... Uh, with great hope about using thorium as a fuel, and they say that many of the problems um, from the kind from using um, what is I don't I see I don't know the difference between these fuel types, but what what we're currently using, which I guess is uranium, right? Yes. Okay, so the difference between thorium and uranium that if you were using thorium instead of uranium, you wouldn't have the problems that were resulted in uh, Fukushima. Is that true? Well, you'd have different problems and probably lesser problems, but, you know, it gets back to money. Uh, all of these concepts are so expensive in comparison to conservation or solar or wind that the crossover occurred this year, that, you know, new solar and new wind are cheaper than new nuclear. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I guess my point is why do we want to invest in a technology that has the potential to you know, destroy a country when you can use you know, smart grids. And I think you know the, the what's happened over the in the 20th century. We needed big power plants, but now with smart grids and computers, we can put little power plants all over the place, yeah. and they can communicate with the computer. Yeah, that's what my friend Harvey Wasserman has been saying for a while. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, so you can, we don't, the, the old paradigm, it's almost like the national line. And, you know, we, we built this thing in France to fight World War I, but the technology changed and World War II just did an end run around it. And it, that these central station plants are huge investments in a national line fighting a 20th century war when, in fact, in the 21st century we have a, we can we can have a different paradigm if we choose to. All right. Well, let me be selfish. Um, what's happening in Japan right now, and we know there was the ghost ship that was found in, in all of this. Um, I read recently about something that apparently happened a year ago, that Hillary Clinton signed some deal with Japan that we weren't going to be testing products that came to the United States. Uh, you know, we're in California. We're we're like in the in the line. You know, you cross the ocean. There we are. Um, can we eat the fish? Can we eat the seaweed in in that uh, our uh, sushi is made from that comes from Japan? Is this safe for us? Are we going to be impacted? And why um, did Hillary sign that? Isn't that kind of scary? It didn't. Is is it true? I think your wife told me this that after she signed that, it was like within a month. The EPA said they were no longer testing. Right. Um, I call it don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't ask, she, don't tell, die. <laughs> yeah, she won't, she won't ask the Japanese what's in it, and they won't tell us what's in it, and everybody will be happy. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I was an uh, expert witness on a case out here in, in, at Indian Point, and um, the people that own that reactor, uh, I found some documents in, in, in the legal process, and one of them was a, uh, a note from the executive saying that Hillary Clinton had been at their plant and they had a minor leak, nothing like a Fukushima minor leak, and she was threatening congressional hearings because her house is only 10 miles away. Mm. So, you know, I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Yeah. And we really need it. Um, uh, we need monitoring of the food. And it's all been about money, though. It's really been protecting the Japanese economy and protecting Tokyo Electric. Um, and the, the, the decisions we're making to not monitor food are really because of the fear of losing money. Uh, I think we should be monitoring food. If the, if the feds won't do it, then universities should. Um, 
You know, that you had a scare recently where somebody came up with a study about iodine in um, seaweed. That's, that, that study was done right after Fukushima, and, of course, iodine only has an eight-day half-life. So there's no more iodine in the seaweed. Um, but, you know, we're getting studies out of uh, the Cascades all the way down into Southern California where we're seeing, you know, cesium in pine needles and, uh, you know, cesium in the ground uh, up in Oregon and, and uh, up in Vancouver. Not a lot, but uh, I guess what my biggest concern is that this stuff, called, it's called bioaccumulation. It yes. works its way up the food chain. Yeah. And sooner or later, we're going to wind up seeing it in salmon and tuna and barracuda, you know, the top of the food chain animals. Mm-hmm. And we're not testing. And, um, and that, it frightens me that we're not testing. Maybe we should be starting to eat that uh, the, that farm salmon because we always go for the wild salmon. Oh, Maybe there's a we need a change. That's another problem. I, go for, <laughs> I, I love salmon, and I'm eating as much of it as I can this year because I'm not sure what 2013 will bring. That's so scary. Okay, let's. Uh, we've got just a couple of minutes. Let's talk with Nathan. Nathan's calling from Oakland. Hi, Nathan. Welcome to KGO. You're on with Arnie Gunderson. Hi there. Thank you so much, Kat, and uh, thank you, Arnie, for all the work that you've done over the last 13 months in keeping us informed and uh, kind of putting this very complex issue into um, terms that are digestible for us laypersons. And I just wanted to say that given the dire and really apocalyptic warnings from um, Mr. Matsumura as well as uh, Ambassador um, uh, Mitsuhei at the recent conference in South Korea, uh, it's it's clear that this issue is is no longer and really haven't been for some time is really no longer a Japanese issue and is the, the purview of the global community given that it, it threatens essentially the entirety of life on this planet and that such uh, as such the inter- international community should be addressing it and uh, uh, that's even something that I know that M- Ambassador uh, Mitsuhei had called for was the creation of a of an international um, scientific team to address spent fuel pool number four and so. I just wanted to share with you and with the listeners that I've taken the initiative of creating a petition on the WhiteHouse.gov site that calls for just that. It asks President Obama to create the Fukushima International Scientific Advisory Team, and if it receives 25,000 signatures by the 8th of May, then it warrants a, a response, an official response from the administration. Good. And okay, how, how do so we do it? How do we get to it to sign very, it? Very easily. It's a, the, the, the URL is very simple. It's wh.gov forward slash capital Q, capital U, lowercase i. Alternatively, if you go to the White House site and you navigate into the petitions area, it's now reached the threshold for being publicly searchable on the White House site. So Good. if you type in Fukushima, you can check that out. So you know, I, I appreciate that very much. I will go there and I will sign it. Maybe we can put that on our website as well to help other people uh, link right to it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nathan. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I, I could talk to you for a long time, Arnie, but I think um, I want to sleep tonight. So, <laughs> But I would like to call you in the future as we talk about these things because they're not going away, um, at least not as quickly as we would like them to. Thanks so much for everything that you've done, and thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before you go, I had I have an email here that I wanted to read to you. Pat is a longtime KGO listener. What does your guest think about nuclear power being low in carbon emissions compared to petrochemical generators? How do we inform these bedwetting echo terrorists to see the big picture? Does that even make sense to you? Um, well, yeah, nuclear <laughs> does produce less carbon than than oil, um, and um, you know. So, it, but if that's all we looked at. It would be the, the way to go. But Peter Bradford, who's a former NRC commissioner, said trying to solve global warming, uh, trying to solve global warming by building nuclear power plants is like trying to solve global hunger by serving everyone caviar. <laughs> and with that, thanks so much for being with us, Arnie. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thanks. You betcha. Arnie Gunderson uh, has been our guest, and we'll stay in touch with him because he has so much to say. And I think, like our last caller said, he puts it into terms that we lay people, we who are not nuclear engineers, we who just really want to do the best we can to try to make ourselves energy independent without killing ourselves, we can really understand, and um, hopefully we can start making the right decisions in this arena.